would be reconciliation. At one meant. It is a bringing back together of carnal man and a holy God. Bringing back together a fleshly human being into relationship with God Almighty. Because it was that day, it was that day that a sacrifice was made for an atonement of all the sins. And you can read it in Leviticus chapter number 16. Read the story how there were two, two bullocks or two goats that were brought and one of them was sacrificed and, and one of them was called the scapegoat. And, and you, you understand how that happens. But it was on this day. It was this day that everybody had been waiting for because it was on this day that their sins would be rolled ahead again, Brother McKinney, for another year. It was this day that they were holy. It was this day that blood was shed for their sacrifices for all the people. It was this day that the high priest would commune with the presence of the Lord on behalf of all the people. It was this day that they would learn, Sister Maria, they would learn if the Lord was still with them or not. It was this day when the high priest would make his way ultimately into the holy of holies. He would be the only man, Brother Derek, the only man that year who would get to be in the presence of the Lord. But when he went in and he communed with the presence of the Lord, he would come out and be seated at the right hand. That signified that the relationship had been restored. Sins had been rolled away for another year. And everyone breathed a sigh of relief. In the New Testament theology... We understand that Jesus Christ became the perfect sacrifice, the Bible says, once for all. And with his death, the veil that was between the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And, and everyone was in, ensured access into the presence of the Lord by grace through faith. And with the death of Jesus Christ, that barrier was taken down. And with the pouring out of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, some 50 days later, the, the presence of the Lord blew into this world for everybody to experience it all the time. But unfortunately, unfortunately, there's many who never felt the power of the Holy Ghost. In following the typology of the tabernacle plan in prayer, and it is a good plan, what we will do, this is what you got to understand. Maybe this is the first most important point you got to understand in praying this. When we go through those steps, you have it on there. The first is the gate. Brother Billy, the high priest, would have walked through the gate first. And when we're praying, our first thing is to walk through the gate. We're going to learn. Enter to his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. But then the, the first piece of furniture he would come to would be the altar. So when we pray, we come to the altar. Is there anybody not understand how that works? Then you go from the altar to the laver. Then you go from the laver through the door. The five pillars, we'll talk about that. And then you go through the five pillars uh, and you'll come to the golden candlestick. It is a, a prayer reminder. It is when, and when you get to this place, there's a focused prayer that you pray. There's an area of prayer that you pray. And what we are in effect doing is taking the same journey that the high priest did on the Day of Atonement. Does that make sense? Does anybody not follow it? Please, please. I maybe have to do... Trip, I may have to make Garrison proud and say every head bowed and every eye closed. Nobody looking but me and God. So somebody might raise their hand and say, I don't understand it. The priest that day, the day of atonement, the high priest would walk, begin a journey into the Holy of Holies. But he would have to stop at every piece of furniture and perform his duties, his responsibilities. And so we don't have to go through that. You do not need a priest because you have a high priest, Jesus Christ. He is the uh, propitiation. He took our sins on him. Okay? But we have a prayer pattern. It was the tabernacle. It was ensured that they would make it into the Holy of Holies. So when we pray this, that's where we're going to end up at 
is in the Holy of Holies in the presence of the Lord. We're going to follow the same path the high priest took. We're just going to do it figuratively and in prayer. Does that make sense? And I can't, I can't move on till we got what we're doing. It was this encounter. Let me tell you something. We got folks right now, they're not here tonight. Some of them. We got folks right now discouraged. That if they would grasp a hold of this, it would change their life. It would change their life. This is very important. Man, I promised to goodness tonight. I promised to goodness that I was thinking that I might be done in 15 or 20 minutes. Shows you what I know. And y'all are following me. <laughs> I hope. That, that didn't go over very good. Maybe not. That's all right. It's important. This is very, very important for us, folks. Everything was set up in the tabernacle according to the direction of God. His plan for reaching his presence, his plan for relationship with man, hinged on the tabernacle being set up the way he said it was to be set up. The process had to be followed the way he said it had to be followed. The tabernacle was set up the same way and every time they stopped, they would carry it through the wilderness and at every stop, the tabernacle had to be set up the exact same way by the exact same people with the furniture all put in the same place. That drives Sister Betty crazy, wouldn't it? Yep. Yeah. I just said she likes to rearrange. I just... I just... Which, which my wife does too. That's another story about how my wife can rearrange our entire bedroom all by herself. And that bed weighs about a thousand pounds. But anyhow, I, I digress. But it was done the same way all the time. Now here's the danger. Here's the danger in this. Is our attention span is not very wide. We tend to get bored. Right? Come on now, somebody sings a song on this Sunday and it's brand new. Everybody hoop a holler and yell and shout. And this time next year they sing the same song. Somebody will say, not again. Huh? So, we have a tendency to get bored. But what does it mean to us as we pray through a prayer pattern? Doing the same thing the same way every day. What does that mean to us? Think about, think about it from this perspective. In a tumultuous world that is ever-changing, that you don't know what you're going to face from one day to the next, that there is a refuge of stability, always the same, safe, comforting, stable, an anchor, a rock, a steadfast place, where I can refocus. And you're going to learn how powerful this is. Where I can refocus. Think about that every day. I can refocus. By going to the Holy of Holies in prayer. D did you know that prayer will make your job better? Did you know prayer will help you at school? Did you know prayer will help you at home? Do you know everything in your life will be better after you pray? Even if nothing changes. place where I can refocus and trust and be safe regardless of what's going on in the outside world. This prayer journey, when I make my way, and, and when you begin to pray it, uh, Sister Maria, you almost feel like you're there. And the outer court where the altar and the, and the, the laver are, that's, everybody can see that. But then when you step into the holy place, everybody can't see that. But the other priests are working in there. But then when you step into the Holy of Holies, there ain't nobody there but you and God. Huh? Think about that every day of your life. Every day of your life, you can have an encounter with Jesus Christ. 
as I pondered the magnitude of what transpired on that day, I began to think about the mindset of the high priest. You got to, you got to think he was afraid. Both kinds of fear. Fear of being unworthy or marred. or the, Here, think about this. Fearful of being an example of what not to do in the presence of the Lord. Fear of being the one that gets pulled out and everybody says, this is what you don't do. Because the difference between you and I, and if we, if we would grasp a hold of this fear of God in the climate that we live in, what a powerful life that we could have. But Brother Billy, if he went in there, messed up, he's dead. You don't go into the presence of the Lord with anything on you, with anything in your heart. It's all got to be taken care of before you get there. Absolutely. And the fact that they did it, Brother Billy, it shows you how, how much they leaned on God, how much they counted on Him for everyday living, how much they treasured this one time of being in the presence of the Lord. The priest was so, so much awe and so much amazement for the, for the, the hope and the power that this day brought with it. How, how long since you've knelt to pray? How long since you've knelt to pray with high expectation and great anticipation and almost trembling with excitement to know I'm just about to get to be with Jesus? It's a perspective. It's a, it's a paradigm that so many don't have because so much of our relationship with God is need-based. I need him, I need him, I need him, I need him for this, I need him. Come on, you've all got your list, we've got it. And please, I mean no disrespect by this. But we can sit there like a bump on a log till prayer request time. Oh, <laughs> whoa, did I, just, did I just say something I shouldn't have? You think about that just for a minute. Have trouble, don't feel like worshiping and don't feel like this and don't feel like that, but we can ask God for something. I hope I hope this is not Greek. I, I really do. I hope this is becoming clear. We've got to recognize there's a whole lot more to this prayer thing than what we thought. There's a whole lot more available to us in prayer. Because the high priest had that high expectation of, I am out of all the people on the face of the earth. I get to meet God today. I think the psalmist may have given us a descriptive passage that would best lead us to the right attitude for entering into the presence of the Lord. Psalms 100. Thank you for that pattern of the tabernacle there. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. How many of you have thought about approaching the Lord to begin your prayer singing? Brother Derek, I felt like a fool. I got to tell you the truth. I felt like a fool, but I did it today. I've done it before. I, I've done it before, but purposefully, Sister Marie, I did it today. Let there be glory and honor to Jesus. Glory and honor to Jesus. And all I could think of, Brother Billy, was somebody was going to come in and catch me. <laughs> How many of you have ever prayed before like you was hiding? Like you were scared you was about to get caught? Where did that come from? That's the flesh. That's the flesh. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye 
that the Lord, he is God. It is he that's made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Notice the decision on how to respond has already been made. Before entering, he says, I will enter with thanksgiving and I will enter with praise. A decision has been made to enter into the presence of the Lord and I'm coming thankful. I'm not coming broken. I might be broken, but I'm going to hit broken in a minute. But the very first thing I'm going to do when I begin my prayer journey is I'm going to let him know I'm thankful. I'm thankful. We have made prayer a necessary evil. Something we have to work into our schedule. Something that we have to do if we need some relief. If we need some help. We need healing. We've got to adjust our attitude about prayer. Prayer. Our communication with God. When you learn to pray, and we're going to go through the steps, when you learn to pray, you understand that prayer is a dialogue. Do you understand what I mean by that? Not only is it time for you to talk to God, but it's time for God to talk to you. Imagine how powerful that is. That the Holy Ghost can begin to lead you in your own prayer time. The Holy Ghost can speak to you. Prayer, communication with God is an essential ingredient to living an overcoming life. Keeping in mind the destination, which is in the presence of the Lord. We can determine the reason for the high expectations of the priest and the people for whom he is to offer the sacrifice. Great expectation, great anticipation. And here's what's so beautiful about it. I want you to grasp a hold of this. There were some of you that your faces popped in my head tonight or this afternoon when I was thinking about this. What was the anticipation about? It was about knowing that the favor of God was upon them. But more importantly, but more importantly, all the junk that they had been, think about this, think about this. One time a year, Brother Johnny, one time a year on the Day of Atonement, a sacrifice was offered, a blood sacrifice. And, and you find out, reading the book of Hebrews, it tells you their sins were rolled back for a year. So what were they feeling on the Day of Atonement? Say that loud, Brother Johnny. Relief! What did it mean? Oh, you grasp a hold of this. I want you to grasp this now. What did, what did it say to them? I was thinking relief, because you know what that day was? A new beginning. Let's say it like this. A fresh start. Is it crazy? Please stay with me right now. Is it crazy to look at every time we go into prayer with the Lord as a fresh start? Where would we be if we looked at it like that? Where's all your condemnation gone? Where's all your guilt gone? Where's all your conviction gone? You got it fixed with the Lord. Every day. You can begin every day by entering into the Holy of Holies. And you can feel and experience what the children of Israel only experienced one time a year. A complete fresh start. A do-over. I get to do it again. It's all under the blood. It doesn't release you for the ramifications of your actions. If you went and bought a new car without, pay, without praying about it, and you pray till you get that fresh start, guess what? You still got to pay that note. He ain't going to deliver you from the note because you made a bad decision, but he's going to teach you, let's stop making them bad decisions. Y'all hearing the brother? Brother Billy. Uh-huh. 
night long. The whole night. The trouble is right there, Brother Billy, is some of us just got lost when you said all night long. Because we want our prayer life like we want everything else. Oh, it was common. And I've told this testimony before, and I, I don't... I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, well, I guess I'm not ashamed. I was just a little bitty old fella. I did really used to be little. But I, Brother Peter, I remember looking in the, I pulled across the curtain. Because Grandma used to have a curtain that hung there between the living room and the bathroom. And you could look in the Grandma and Grandpa's bedroom past the bathroom. And there was a bookshelf right there. On this side of the curtain, you pull that curtain beside, and I looked in there, and I saw Brother Pete sitting at the head of the bed. Because Grandma got sick, and Grandma didn't believe in going to the doctor. They called all the family over, and it was inconvenient. You listen to me. Some of you that talk about inconvenient. Well, I can't, I can't do this. You know, I got a kid. They loaded all of us up. Grandma called and needed prayer. They loaded us all up. They went over to Grandma's house and made us all pallets in the living room floor. Then they all went to Grandma's bedroom, Brother Billy. And you know what they did? They prayed. You know how long? Till the sun came up the next morning. I remember it. I got to sleep in front of the stove, and I could lay in front of the stove and lean over and peek in the curtain. And you know what? When the sun came up, Grandma lifted up her hands in bed, started talking in tongues, and God healed her immediately, completely. And, and you know what, Brother Billy? What brought that back to my mind, believe it or not? She got up and wanted to cook breakfast for everybody. Let me tell you something. She wasn't sleeping while they was praying either. I'm telling you, this prayer stuff works. And if you learn to go the steps that are there before you and pray, there will be amazing things. One of the things you're going to find out as you begin to pray this pattern is that you're going to mess around and run into the Holy Ghost at a lot of different places on your journey. Sometimes it's going to be when I enter into his gates with thanksgiving and you just feel the, this one's going to be good because there's the Holy Ghost. Sometimes it's at the candlestick. Sometimes it's at the table of shoe bread or the altar of incense. It has been at the laver. Matter of fact, the first day I started back praying this, it was at the laver. The word of God washed with the pure water of his word that you move into the presence of the Lord. But it's a fresh start. Think about that. How powerful is it that all of my prayers are, are fresh starts or do-overs? But the thing is, Brother Billy, you just brought it to our attention. We want it like drive through at McDonald's. Yeah. We want it while we're folding clothes or something. Those people that worked it out, they put everybody to bed. They went and pulled their Bible out. And instead of sleeping, they read their Bible and prayed. I remember Brother Beckton. I've told this before, but Brother, Brother Cleveland Beckton, if you never got the chance to be around Brother Beckton, oh my Lord and mercy, you missed out. He was a treasure. He was, uh, uh, Brother McDougal talk, told me about it the other day. He was there. But in 1978 at General Conference, I believe it was 1978, at General Conference, he was the General Secretary of the United Pentecostal Church, the second highest office of the United Pentecostal Church International. And he said, I believe I'm going to roll for the Lord. And he laid down on the platform and began to roll. And as he rolled and went past people, the Holy Ghost came across like doing the wave. 
and filled that entire place up. But I, I said all that to say this. I was at a meeting once that he was there. I got to hear him testify. And it was almost like Paul or somebody. And the preacher called for everybody to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and pray. Brother Beckton said, I'll do it. The only thing is, I'm going to get up at 4 o'clock and pray because I get up at 5 and pray every day anyhow. In order for it to be a sacrifice for me, I'm going to have to get up another hour early and pray. This ain't going to fall out of heaven and hit you. You know, this thing, this thing ain't going to wake you up in the morning slapping you in the face. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Great expectation, great anticipation. If you thought about it going to be a fresh start, how powerful would your prayer be? Is it fair to say, and I'm coming to a close, is it fair to say that the way you approach prayer can determine how you're going to finish praying? So I know it's entered to his gates with thanksgiving and there's just so much that we can be thankful about. But if there's a high level of expectation, it determines what you're going to find at the end. Because the Bible says, according to your faith, be it unto you. Enter with thanksgiving. Give thanks to God for all he's done. Holy Ghost, a good church, a good home, friends, a job, family, health, finances, answer prayer. Any number of things you can thank God for. You thank God for clean sheets and towels. Thank God for air conditioning in the summertime and thank you for heat in the wintertime. Have you thanked God for a bed to sleep in? Huh? There's so many things that we can enter to be thankful for. Clap your hands, Psalms 47 and 1. Play music, sing songs and make noise, Psalms 150. Lift up holy hands, 1 Timothy 2 and 8. With the knowledge that in Psalm 22 and 3 says he inhabits the praises of Israel. So sing, clap, leap, lift up hands, sing songs unto the Lord with the expectation of being ushered into his presence. And let me tell you about red, blue, and purple. If you can't think of nothing to be thankful about, maybe your praise is inhibited because of a lack of faith, then let this be what it leads you into his gates. Red. He made them red, blue, and purple. The gate. Red signifies the suffering sacrifice. The lamb slain for our sins. So if you can't thank him for anything else, thank him for Calvary. Purple signifies royalty. He's the king of kings. The alpha, the omega, the beginning, the ending which is and was and is to come, the Almighty. Thank him for his kingship. Thank him for being in his kingdom. Thank him that his kingdom can come. And blue signifies the heavenly. He's omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. It's red, purple, and blue. It's a reminder of why I even get to be here. Because of the sacrifice that he made. He left heaven and came to earth he left the blue he left the purple for the red and all of it signifies who he is he's the king of my life he's the king of everything all things are created by him and for him it's a reminder of why I am coming to him is because he's God because all things are in his hands because all things are under his feet because of who and what he is that I enter to his gates with thanksgiving. That's why I'm here. Because of who and what he is. Stand with me. Just for a minute. Let's practice. Lord, I will enter your gates with thanksgiving. And I will enter your courts with praise. I give you thanks, God, for everything I have. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. Everything I've got that's a blessing you gave me. And I thank you for every time you chased me. I thank you for every time you touched me. I thank you for every word you've spoken to me. I thank you for the Holy